Oh, yes, Crow. 100%. She's definitely 100%. Young one woke on a metal table. She struggled to sit up, still groggy from Crow's injection. The metal table shifted under her, but she did not fall off its cold surface. She gripped its edges to steady herself and looked around. She could have been in another assembly room. More dust and grime covered this room like the main area she had first entered. But the welding machines in here looked functional, and the metal limbs looked serviceable. Somewhat rusted, but not nearly as bad as what she had first seen. The parts rested on hooks and waited to be attached to someone. But the room seemed to have a second purpose. Three lab workbenches sat to one side. Test tubes filled with blood samples populated one of the bench tops, a microscope station on another, and on the third workbench, a set of surgical tools, saws, forceps, and sharp knives. She recognized some of the science equipment from the books Ethan had shown her. This room could also serve as a lab for a scientist or a doctor. Crow and another man stood over a test tube and argued. Crow crossed his long arms, tapping his foot impatiently. Young one would have to escape him before he noticed her. Finish this project of yours. I want Farm Fresh's eyes, Crow said. If you had quit toying with the dirty bloods, this would have been quicker, the other man said. And I would have lost the chance at Farm Fresh. Honestly, Crow, you've wanted to be rid of those dirty blood children for some time. Crow snorted through his throat's speaker box. Huh. Don't go thinking that some urchin dirty blood could ever replace me. My services aren't cheap because I deliver. Young one felt the room spin for a moment. A nearby metal stand held a liquid-filled bag with a plastic tube attached at the bottom. She grabbed at the metal stand. It wobbled and then toppled to the floor. Her vision settled again. Both Crow and the other man looked at her. Doctor, my farm fresh awakens, Crow said. Now, now, take it easy on her. He did look kind of like a doctor. A white lab coat covered his bulbous body. A stethoscope hung around his thick, flabby neck. And he wore a large head mirror. Young one decided that he should get rid of the head mirror. It made him look more like a potato with an oversized eye than a doctor. Her eyes, doctor. You've promised, Crow said. After the blood transfusion, and only if the test subject can actually deliver. The doctor limped over to her, walking in an unnatural way. Only then did she notice that the top half of his head had been replaced with a metal plate. His grotesque appearance repulsed her. Like Crow, he was part metal and part something else. The doctor tried to comfort her, taking her shaky hand and patting at a bandage on top. Don't be frightened by my appearance. Anyone infected by the virus is in some way incomplete. But you are immune, and you will never have to worry about such body replacements. You are 100%. Where is 44? Young one said. The doctor patted her hand again. Don't worry about your dirty blood friend. She is infected. Her tissue slowly rots away. But she could go with me to Techna Magnus. The council will help her. <laughs> no, no. The council would never help her. They can't afford to give metal parts to just anyone. The doctor's comment worried young one. Then who did the council turn into a metal person? Young one wanted to carry apples to Techna Magnus and hum the beautiful songs. She wanted to bring joy and hope to the world. If the council wouldn't help her, there must surely be another way to do such a thing. Could you help me, doctor? The doctor grinned again, displaying even more rotten teeth. Ah, you have vision. Come, I must show you something. Then he helped young one off the metal table. She wobbled at first, her footing unsure and her apprehension only making her footing worse. The doctor insisted that 
they walk over to the other end of the lab. Her steps improved as Crow watched her, his dark eyes staring. He unsettled her, and young one hesitated. But then she noticed a metal man standing next to Crow. The chill from the cold metal table quickly wore off. Her footing turned steady, and she overcame her fear of Crow as she gazed at the beautiful metal creation. The metal man loomed at least two feet above her and several inches over Crow. Rusting scrap parts had been assembled over hidden flesh. The only remaining humanity was some visible tissue at his neck. Electronic wires ran from his larynx and up into his metal head. Yes, it really was beautiful. What stood in front of her was a metal creation that shined with joy and hope. The metal man slowly turned its head and looked down at her. Innocent child, how old are you? The metal man's voice rose high and musical. It reminded her of when the metal people marched by the farm, humming their beautiful song. I'm twelve summers, she said. Do not wish this upon yourself, child. You have much to live for. I will bring joy and hope to the world, just like you. The metal man slowly shook his head. My electronic eyes no longer see the beautiful colors in this world. My tissue rots under this metal coffin, and that will someday rust. I have no joy. I have no hope. How could the metal man say such things? Young one had seen them march by the farm with heads held high. Their bodies gleamed in the sun. A banner streamed behind. A metal heart shines brightest. The metal man should be proud and happy. The doctor raised his hand, interrupting the metal man. He doesn't understand the joy and hope that he will bring. He turned to young one and smiled. But you do. You must help him see that. But how? I'm not made of metal yet. Ah, but you have something greater. Your blood is immune to the virus. With your gift, he can go on living forever within his metal body. Inside, what remains of his covered flesh will stop rotting. He will become the first prototype to defeat the horrible rot. You can save Techna Magnus. You might even be able to save your friend 44. Crow snorted again. He also wants to get back in the council's good graces. The doctor shot Crow a horrible look. Lumps of flesh that gathered at the doctor's remaining hairline grew red and quivered. The council has always been short-sighted. They released that virus when I told them not to. Solve a war and kill a civilization. I warned them. Then he turned back to young one. Will you give the metal man your special gift? Will you give him your blood? This was so confusing. The doctor said that the council would never turn her into a metal person. Instead, she should give her blood to the metal man. It would be a gift that could help everyone, including 44. But at what cost to herself? Would she ever know if she had brought joy and hope to the world? Maybe, young one finally said. The doctor eagerly rubbed his hands together. You will live forever through science. And they will write books about you, doctor, Crow said with a sneer. The metal man lurched forward. He stepped in front of the doctor. You will bleed her dry. I will not let you harm the innocent child. Out of my way. You impede my science. The doctor tried to shove the metal man aside, but his bulk could not be moved. The top half of the doctor's head turned an even brighter red. He grabbed a nearby pair of forceps and pinched pointlessly at a machine hand. The doctor looked like a frustrated lobster trying to taunt the unmoving metal man. The doctor finally gave up and threw the forceps at the metal man's chest. It dropped harmlessly off his chest cavity. Your brain will fade, you short-sighted tin can! Your heart will give out. I must perform a complete transfusion or you will never be 100%, the doctor said. The metal man grabbed the doctor by the white coat. He raised his bulbous body up into the air with a quick jerk. The doctor wailed, arms flailing. The metal man shook him. 
You make monsters, Doctor. You are not 100%, the metal man said. Then he flung the flailing Doctor into a welding machine. A torch turned on and arced the Doctor's headplate to the base of the welder. He screamed once and went limp. Crow growled through his throat speaker. Miserable pile of scrap. I'll have my farm fresh eyes. In a blink, Crow leapt to the workbench with the surgical tools. He snatched up a large saw. Young one stood by, petrified. Run, innocent child. Leave this place while you can, the metal man said. Crow swung the serrated blade at the metal man, feigning an attack. The metal man swung back, slow and clumsy. This is going to be easy, Crow said. Crow feigned again, only this time he was not so lucky. When he leaned back, the metal man's hand smashed against his left eye. Dark glass sprayed everywhere. Crow looked stunned for a moment. Bits of electronics, silicone, and glass fell to the floor. He touched the hollowed socket. I will not live like this, the metal man said. Crow made a terrible grin. I'll see to it that you don't. Crow whirled around, his duster jacket covering the metal man's eyes. Then Crow jumped behind him, the deadly saw now at the metal man's fleshy larynx. The metal man tried to turn, but he was too slow and clumsy. Crow simply turned when he turned, always out of his vision. The metal man was blind to Crow's attack. I'm going to enjoy disassembling you. Crow said. When the sparks began to fly from the metal man, young one finally ran. She could not bear to see such a horrible sight. Once out of the room, she spotted a sign that read basement level. There was a stairwell, and she quickly climbed up the steps. Young one stumbled once and recovered. At the top of the stairwell, she searched for an escape from the building. 44 was nowhere to be found. Back down the corridor Young One had first entered, the holding cells were empty. She didn't even spot Ethan's lockpick, which had fallen into the girl's cell. Young One could waste no more time. She thought of Crow's terrible grin just before he had attacked the metal man. She dared not risk being caught by him. Maybe the other children could help her. When she came to the large area with the red steel door, Young One ran out into the night but the other children were nowhere to be seen.